Electrons, like all matter, have a wave and particle-like behavior. This is a fundamental tenet of quantum mechanics. We've known about this behavior for decades, but seeing it is another question. The double slit experiment proved that electrons can behave as waves. But I'm not talking about free flying electrons. I'm talking about electrons inside of crystals. It has been more than 90 years since Felix Bloch first proposed that electrons move as waves through crystals. Recently, a team from UC Santa Barbara has finally imaged this wave function. But to do so, they need to use some pretty advanced equipment, including a laser the size of a room. So how did they do it? Let's discuss it. Back in 1928, Felix Bloch published his doctoral thesis on the quantum mechanics of electrons in crystal lattices, in which he explained that electrons moving in a periodic potential can be described as a series of plane waves. By a periodic potential, he was referring to the atoms in a crystal lattice that have a repeating spatial pattern. Importantly, he was right. And this formalism makes it much easier to theoretically describe the wave function of electrons in these materials, and thus describe qualities of the crystal itself. We currently use this theory to do all sorts of calculations, but measuring the wave function itself has eluded us. Now, it's not just this type of wave function that's difficult to measure. In general, we can't measure the full wave function of a quantum object because it's complex. This complex component of the wave function is related to the phase of the quantum object, and therefore we can never measure the absolute phase of this. The reason for this is that we measure in real space, and therefore when we measure the wave function which is complex, we collapse it down onto the real space, losing information that was stored in the imaginary component. Thus, we can only ever measure a relative phase, and therefore we need something to compare that phase to. In this latest work, that room size laser was exactly this reference. There is one other issue with measuring these wave functions. Defects. Little defects in the crystal lattice destroy the wave function. As the wave is propagating through the material, when it interacts with these defects, it changes the wave function itself, sometimes collapsing it. Thus, the scientists decided to use a relatively simple medium, gallium arsenide, because it can be grown to an extremely high level of purity. By exposing this material to an infrared laser, electrons can be liberated from the clutches of their atoms. When this happens, the electron leaves behind a hole which is positively charged, which can also move in the crystal lattice. In gallium arsenide, there are two types of holes, light holes and heavy holes, which are essentially the same, but one has a larger effective mass. Now here's the key to the experiment. When these electron hole pairs are created, they are exposed to a second laser, the big one, which is a strong terahertz laser. This secondary laser creates a strong oscillating electric field inside of the material. And this strong electric field causes the electron and hole to move. When the two lasers are synchronized correctly, the electron and hole will first move apart before turning around and then coming back together. When they combine, they annihilate and emit light. And this light holds key information about the polarization of the wave function just before they collapsed. By changing the synchronization time of the lasers, the phase could be mapped out and therefore the wave function could be reconstructed. As the holes are also moving in the large electric field created by the laser, this type of experiment can actually measure the difference between heavy and light holes and therefore probe their wave functions separately. So, why is this even important? Well, holes play a crucial role in electronics, and some researchers believe that they may even hold significant benefits over using electrons directly. But we need to find the right materials to take advantage of this. One of the researchers, Professor Mark Sherwin, said this. The reason the block wave functions are important is because for almost any calculation you want to do involving holes, you need to know the block wave function. So this technique may lead to discovering new exotic materials that can have various applications in technology. Sherwin goes on to say, if we can accurately reconstruct block wave functions for various materials, then that will inform the design and engineering of all kinds of useful and interesting things 
like lasers, detectors, and even some quantum computing architectures. This technique certainly holds a lot of promise, and this was a very good demonstration. But we'll have to wait and see if this actually does lead to any new technologies. Thanks for watching, have fun, see you next time.